Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. Thou hast fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I also will recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God, and thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. Behold, everyone that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children, and thou art the sister of thy sisters which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite and your father was an Amorite. I wanted to hold off, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Ezekiel is talking about Jerusalem. And when he's using this imagery, he is speaking to the city of Jerusalem. So you can understand a little bit here. And thine elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand. And thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways nor done after their abominations. But as if it, that were a very little thing. Thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. This is Jerusalem. More than Sodom. More than Samaria. And as I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Notice verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins. But thou hast multiplied thine own abominations more than they. And hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou Has done. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight. The sins. That destroyed Sodom. The sins that destroyed Sodom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus we thank you. Right now for your divine touch God. And we ask you to anoint these lips of clay. To teach the word of the Lord. And we'll be careful to give you praise. In that name that's above every name. Praise the Lamb of God. God bless you tonight. You may be seated. Amen. It is often that we hear of the sins of Sodom. How many times have you heard a preacher including myself, say, if God doesn't hurry and come back, He's going to have to apologize to Sodom. In fact, in spite of the title of this message, it does not highlight necessarily the sins of Sodom only. But Ezekiel chapter 16 is not really about Sodom at all. But rather about its sister, Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in the second verse of this chapter, God speaks to Ezekiel. And says in Ezekiel 16 and 2. Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abomination. And for the next, I wrote 68 in my notes, but I think it's 63 verses. God speaks through Ezekiel 
to reveal the abominations of Jerusalem and to pronounce judgment upon them. And he shows us that Jerusalem is far worse than Sodom or Samaria ever thought about being. But in doing so, Ezekiel outlines the sins of Sodom in a very poignant synopsis found in verse 49 and 50. And he basically tells Jerusalem, you did exactly the same thing they did and struggled with the same sins that Sodom and Samaria did, except you just took it to another level. It's basically what he's saying. And it would be impossible to talk about the condition of our world today and the coming judgment that we are going to face without mentioning Sodom and Gomorrah and Samaria and, of course, Jerusalem as it's talking about. But when we look at the story of Sodom, uh, we immediately go to the homosexuality, the lesbianism, the incest, and the idolatry and all these things. But the Bible has something to say that points out the root of all these other sins. And the prophet Ezekiel, in pronouncing judgment against Israel, he declares that Israel was more wicked than her sister Sodom. And he proceeds to list the sins of Sodom in Ezekiel 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, verse 48, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. And behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hands of the poor and the needy. And for just a few minutes tonight, I want to focus on these four things that Ezekiel points out through the voice of God that destroyed Sodom. First of all, he said, the sin of Sodom, which you have also Jerusalem, and to an extent beyond even Sodom, was the sin of pride. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. The Hebrew word here, and I know I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, but gaon, and it means arrogance or the swelling, proud and pompous. And the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I don't know about you, but I'll be the first to say that I struggle with this particular sin. There are things in my life that uh, raise their head where pride begins to get in the way of my relationships. Pride gets in the way of my consecration. And pride gets in the way oftentimes of me being willing to fall on my face and say, God, I was wrong. God, would you forgive me and give me another chance? And I want to just pause here and say this. Friend, if there ever was a time that we need to throw pride out the window and say, Lord, it does not matter what I may feel within this human flesh. I've got to throw pride down and fall down in an altar and begin to repent of my sin and let God pour out his spirit upon me but we live in a culture that has taken the concept of pride to another level amen every moment and every effort is made to exalt man and sin above God Idolatry is rampant in this so-called Christian state, which it's quickly becoming one that is not a Christian state. Through pride, we have begun to worship everything and anything except the only thing that deserves our worship, and that is God. Amen. Amen. We live in a culture that takes an entire month to celebrate this concept. They call it Pride Month. 
It's no accident that the movement is called gay pride and that the sin of pride is associated with the sin of homosexuality and has evolved to encompass every conceivable immoral sin or lifestyle for which both Sodom and Samaria were destroyed. If we want to talk about Jerusalem, Ezekiel, where are you at in this day and hour? I wonder what if he was called back from eternity and say, Ezekiel, I want you to point out the sin and the abomination of America. Well, I believe that what he would have to say or what he said about Jerusalem would compel in comparison to what he would say about us. And friend, every day, all I do is go to the Fox News app or on the internet and social media and I say, dear God, we're far worse than Sodom or Samaria or Jerusalem ever thought about me. I hope you're just listening. And I guess you are because it's real quiet. When I listen to much of the rhetoric, and I'm trying to not be political, but it's hard sometimes. But when I listen to much of the rhetoric that of the Democratic Convention, it reminded me of when Paul was preaching against idols in Acts 19, in verse 28. And the Bible says, And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. If there ever was a word that describes the platform of this progressive liberals uh, agenda that we find in America. It is absolute and utter confusion. It's chaos. It is deception that the enemy has tricked our culture into embracing. And he said the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And they begin to persecute them. And, and I want to tell you something, friend. There's going to come a time when moral people stand up before a congregation and preach the truth and preach against idolatry and preach against sin that there will be an uproar and a mob will grab them and dra drag them into a theater somewhere and there will be mass confusion that will follow. Amen. Praise God. Second Timothy 3 and 1 says this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. Led away with diverse lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This sounds so familiar, does it not? Amen. Pride. The pride of this world that we live in and how they're fulfilling it. Is putting Sodom and Jerusalem to shame. And all those cities were destroyed. 
And I know God had a covenant that he would form with Israel to return them back to their land. And it has happened and God's got a purpose. But he prophesied even that part of it in Ezekiel 16 here. But for the time being, God said, you have uh, committed abominations and you have done these sins. And one of the greatest ones is the pride that you've allowed to come upon you to think that you, uh, you know, done all of this and arrived at where you are by yourself. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But do you understand that we didn't get this great country of America because of our own ideals? This, this country exists because of the divine providence of God. And I believe he put it in place for a distinct purpose to orchestrate his prophetic a will concerning the children of Israel and concerning the land of Israel in the last days. That's why we're here course to propagate the gospel and to spread it around the world but friend we're vastly abandoning God we're walking away in our own pride and we're boasting in our own abilities to saying that we arrived here at our own, own by our own power but friend we cannot do anything that's pride we can't do anything without God Next one is fullness of bread. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread. Amen. The Hebrew word, Seba. Got a little, make a little exchange here, guys. Thank you. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride and fullness of bread. The Hebrew word is Siba. It means satisfied. Fullness. Instead of actually referring to food, it seems to be referring to the feeling you get when you are well fed. And even overly fed. But that satisfied feeling, willingly desiring for things to stay as they are. Everyone wants to stay in their little comfort zone. No one is willing to make the changes necessary to correct our course. And we are satisfied with the status quo and the drowsy direction that our sleep-ridden minds are taking us. Brother Burks, don't preach anything that's going to make me change. Don't teach anything that's going to make me feel uncomfortable. I'm just, I'm just satisfied with the way things are. I, I want to come to church when I want to. But I want to stay home when I want to. And I don't want to feel uncomfortable about it. I'm satisfied. We got us a new church. Weren't you happy about that? Got us a new church. And we got some nice pews. Or not pews, but chairs. We got some nice chairs. To sit in, Brother Billy. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see y'all here. Y'all been fighting it, the sickness, and but God's brought you back. Amen. But everyone wants to stay the same. They just want to be satisfied. They're they're okay with how it is. I don't know about you, but I am not satisfied. I am not happy about the direction our world is going in. I'm not happy about the direction our politics are going in. I'm not ha happy about the direction our school system is going in. I'm not happy about the direction that our church is trying to go in. This comfort, this satisfaction, this mediocrity, this, this uh, just, just willing to, to be uh, satisfied with the status quo. I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with myself. I, I, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not at a place where I feel like God needs me to be to help carry this church forward. And I'm unsatisfied with myself. I, I'm not, I don't want to be, I, to get to where I'm just complacent and willing to just go along with the flow and just ride along as ever, and you know, with the wind and just let everything go along. I, I don't want to be well fed and just popped up in my recliner. Now, I'm not asking you to raise your hand because some of you may be struggling right now, but most of us, we, 
We got our bill. How many of you got your bills paid? Got food to eat. And got a car to drive. New shoes. Brother Justin helped me get. Now I saw a house. Think about that. Don't don't you? Don't you got somewhere to go tonight? You just walk home and you to flip the switch and the light comes on. Air condition. This one applies in America more than it does in a lot of places because in third world countries, they, they don't have the amenities that we have, but we are in the Laodicean age, if you will, and we're so satisfied. Everything's so comfortable, and if we don't have it, we'll go somewhere and get it. If we don't have it, our government will give it to us. By the way, it's it's not really giving it to you. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. They, they take it from somebody else and then give it to you. And then they make you give it back. Praise God. You know, you, know how the, you know how the mafia and organized crime works? They scare you to death, threaten to kill you. And then say, we'll protect you if you'll pay us. And then once you pay them, you're in their pocket. And that is the way the government is, if you're not careful. They want to destabilize the masses. This is also the concept of socialism and Marxism and the, along those directions. To the point to where you have fear. Then you say, who's going to be our savior? And the government says, that's us. Even though we are part of the reason why you're in the shape you're in. We'll deliver you from the position we put you in. And we're not just going to do it, but you're going to pay us to do it. And once you pay us, now we got you. Now you owe us. And we're going to use the IRS and the Social Security Administration and the government and, 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 re- and all of that to enforce it. Because without it, if you don't pay it, well, I'm starting to get way off here. We, go, we can't just be satisfied. We've got to make see some changes. They were full of bread. And then he said, and then, uh, behold, this was the iniquity of our sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, satisfied, and an abundance of idleness was in her and her, her daughters. Idleness. The Hebrew here is shakat. And I know that's not right, but there it is. Laziness, unwillingness to put forth the effort to change. Similar to the other one. Everyone wants to stay in their little comfort zone. No one's willing to make the changes that's necessary to change the course. We live in a generation who's idle. You ever been in a position where, whether whatever reason, you had some time and you didn't, didn't know what you was going to do, and it was idleness? You know, the, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Acts 2 and 4. <laughs> but sometimes your mind get, gets to working on you. And, and idleness, we need to be about the Father's business. So, I, you know, I, that, that drives me crazy when, whenever uh, one of my kids come in and say, Well, there's nothing to do here. Now, you, you don't tell me that. I'm bored. Nothing to do here, huh? Let me let you in on what there is to do here. And brother, after a while, they're going to start putting two and two together. Whatever you do now when we go out, I don't care how idle it is. I don't care how you know, bored you get. Don't tell daddy. That there's nothing to do here. Because I promise you buddy. There's plenty to do. Around the house. And all of that. But. They were idle. And they were following after every little old thing. That came along. Trying to satisfy their curiosity. And to amuse themselves. 
We are in a generation that's looking for amusement, looking for entertainment. That's all they want to do is idly fill their minds with every kind of a stimulation they can all the time. Next time you go to the bathroom, leave your phone outside, whether it's to take a bath or whatever. I can start telling you, say, Brother Verse, we don't have a problem with this. I'm telling you, you do have one. You do. Go ahead and admit it. And I could go on about that, but I'm trying to hurry. The, the next thing that they had was an unwillingness to help the needy. And basically that translates to selfishness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. It points to an attitude of selfishness and unwilling to help those in need. Mainly because they simply did not care. We better realize that we must care about people. We've got to care about the loss. We must care about more than just ourselves. We're living in a world that's so selfish. All they think is about is me, me, me. What is in it for me? And selfishness is born and rooted in pride. We, we don't need selfishness, but we need selflessness. Amen? Amen? People... I've, I've, I never watched them all the way through, but there are recordings out there of people on bridges getting ready to jump off and throwing themselves on tracks in front of subways and all of that. And there's thousands of videos of these incidents. If there ever speaks to selfishness and an attitude of not caring, that's it. Do you think for a second that if I see somebody trying to throw in the towel, that I'm going to pull out my phone and begin to record it? It's a shame. And then in the back of their mind, you wait till, uh, you know, the, 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 the attention that this is going to draw. Amen. We need the people to stop being selfish and start being helpful. Hallelujah. And by the way, I don't know why I feel to say this, but if the enemy has ever tried to tempt you to take your own life, do you, you do not listen to him. Amen. That is never the answer. There is a God that cares about you and nobody else knows what's going on. I'm telling you, God knows what's going on. And he shed his blood for you. He died for you on a cross. There is hope. There is a reason to live. And there is a life beyond your struggle or your trial. Amen. But I want to point out two things that are mentioned in verse 50. I didn't include them in the four just because they sort of fall under the categories of the preceding ones. But they bring a little more narrow focus in verse 50. He said, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. They were committing abominations. And they were uh, haughty in their attitudes. You know, we live in a world where sin is not just committed and hidden, but it's flaunted and celebrated. There's a haughtiness about it. And there's something about that sin of immorality that takes this to a different level. And much of this is an abomination unto God. But one of these abominations that Jerusalem is found to have committed, we see it a little earlier in the same chapter in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 20. He said, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them, to be devoured. And this 
Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? Do you, do you take this lightly? That you have taken your children and sacrificed them to the idols that I told you not to worship? And thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. That was ritual sacrifice where they burned them before an idol. And God hated child sacrifice. It was one of the things that he mentioned throughout scripture. And it's one of the indictments to toward paganism. And that is that they offered up their children. And, and I understand the imagery. But God sent a savior when he commanded it to, uh, to Abram. And he, he used a realm to represent that he would be the substitute. And that people would not actually be sacrificed bodily and bodily harm. But they would sacrifice their lives to the Lord as a praise. But he hated child sacrifice. We live now in a spiritual kingdom. Under a new covenant. And the battles that we fight are spiritual battles. The sacrifices that we give and don't give are spiritual. And friend I want to tell you. That our children are being sacrificed. On the altars of immorality. And on the altars of, uh, of popularity. We are offering them to the wolves if you will. They're not just being taught arithmetic and language and history. They're, they're being taught a revised history. But they're being indoctrinated in our schools. With an ideology of immorality. And an idea that God never intended for them to have. But if you want to get. Truthful and down to really where it's at. We are literally sacrificing our babies. Through a sanitized description that we call abortion. I literally was sick at my stomach last night. When I listened to one of the candidates during the debate talk about no one had a right to tell a woman what she could do with her body. I want to tell you something right now. I wish I would have been standing where President, former President Trump was standing. You let me debate them. I, 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 would, I would relish it. I'm telling you, he's too arrogant. <laughs> you got to vote not for a person. You got to vote for the platform that supports your morals. What's best for your morals. Judeo-Christian morals, that's where you have to vote. What's best for the country. You have to vote for who is going to make the country better. You have to vote for who's going to be, make you safer in their foreign policy. And you're going to have to vote for who's going to make a better economy so we can survive. Forget about their personalities. Because he makes me aggravated sometimes. And I want to say, stop running your mouth. Because you're going to lose the election. But when you're debating three people instead of one, it is kind of hard. But anyway, I've got to get past politics. Back to what I was saying. As she began to vomit the abomination of sacrificing children as if it was some right to be celebrated as part of her uh, agenda. I literally got sick at my stomach. And I understand there's extenuating circumstances. But there is a fine line. And you better understand that your choice about your body starts when you crawl into bed with somebody. That's where you tell your body. That's where you control your body. Not after you have conceived as a result of your lust. 
And if you want to talk about not telling somebody to do something with their bodies, then let's reference what happened during COVID when they tried to force everybody to take a vaccine. Now, I'm not against you if you took one, and I'm not against you if you didn't. That's up to you, but it was your choice, not the government's choice. So don't gaslight me into saying you're going to do something you've already done. Well, like I said, I wish I'd have been debating. But the point is, we think nothing about slaying an innocent child in the beauty and the miracle of creative life that can only and did only come from God. God gave it. We don't have the right to take it. God hated murder, which is what I'm calling it, before the law of Moses was ever written. Long before. And the people knew the law of God. That's why Cain, uh, when he slew Abel, he knew he was wrong because he had, they had already been taught about the, the, the laws of God. It was just Moses that wrote them down under the law of Moses. But I'm telling you, God hates sacrifices of children and he hates premeditated murder. And if there ever was a premeditated meditated idea, it's whenever you walk into an abortion clinic and get an abortion. Planned Parenthood set up outside the DNC this year. I don't think they were a part of necessarily of the DNC, but they went there because their number one supporters are the DNC. And while the Democratic National Convention was uh, convention was underway, they gave nine abortions in a portable facility outside the convention hall. And celebrated it. I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to try to influence necessarily your voting. Because that's your right. But I am supposed to influence morality. And I don't know how, I don't know how to do it. Without every now and then bringing something in to do with our uh, politics. I'm going to be very careful about it. And I'll try to respect this sacred desk. But. Folks, we better realize where we're headed. God destroyed Sodom. He destroyed Samaria. And he destroyed Jerusalem. And they pale in comparison to what is happening and on the scale that it's happening on in this day and hour that we live in. There is only, the only people that will stand up are people like us that have a conscience and that are trying their best to live a moral life and to live for God. Amen. And what I'm teaching tonight is considered hate speech in the, in, among uh, the, the public arena. And, and there will come a time when we will be sued and, and the charges will be brought against us for trying to teach what's wrong and what's right. But we have forgotten and America has forgotten who set them up. It's so easy to forget where we came from. And in this same chapter, Ezekiel points that out to Jerusalem. In verse 4 of 16, he said this, And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother an Hittite. There's imagery going on here. And as for thy nativity, in the day, verse 4, thou wast born, thy navel was not cut. Neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. No one pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out into the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, live. 
Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. He said, Jerusalem, you didn't have a chance. You were just like a baby that was discarded in the middle of a field right after being born. But it was I that found you. And when I walked by, I lifted you up. And I said, you're going to live, baby. You're going to grow. And you were mine. But then he said, later, whenever I blessed you, and you grew and you became beautiful and you prospered and you did according and you were vowed and looked up to among the nations and all of that. Then suddenly your pride got a hold of you and you were lifted up within yourself and you said it was I that done all of this. I never had a God and you then turned in the very ones that discarded you like a piece of trash and you begin to worship them and you begin to sacrifice your children to them. So I'm going to judge you now. I want to tell you something right now. It's easy as child, children of God. Whenever God finds us polluted in our own blood. Some of you were lost and didn't have nowhere to go. Your life was torn down and in shambles. And God walked by and looked at you and said, live. I say unto thee, live. He gave you an opportunity. He restored your life. He delivered you from your aggressors. And you were blessed beyond measure. But after a while when you get comfortable. And when you get satisfied in your own blessing. And when you get complacent. And everything seems like you did it all. And then you begin to, 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 to have pride. And to worship idols and do other things. God's going to come to you suddenly. And say you didn't listen to me. You better repent. Or I'll bring judgment against you we were in the same condition exposed to the elements and dying like a helpless newborn baby but God found us he picked us up we owe him the United States of America whether they want to admit it or not owes God everything everything I don't know about you, but I want the sins that destroyed Sodom to remind me of where I'm at. God, don't let me be caught up in pride. Amen. Don't let me get to that place where I'm satisfied, full of bread and just sitting around idle whenever your kingdom is coming and when there's people dying who are lost without God, never sharing the gospel, never caring about anybody, unwilling to even help in the time of need. Praise God. My Lord. Has this made any sense tonight? Praise God. We're, we're, we're in tremendous times, folks. I'm telling you, it's not going to be too much longer that God's going to come back. I, want, I wonder, will you be ready? Will you be attentive? Will your lamps be trimmed and burning bright? Will, will you be sitting there saying, God, I'm doing everything I can to live for you. I'm trying to save my family. I don't intend to sacrifice my children. I'm reaching the lost, God, but I'm also looking for your return. Amen. If you feel like you want to be ready, why don't we just stand and gather around the front just for a moment. Amen. Praise God. We think we're sheltered from it in Texas. It changes every year. I think the last time I looked, the GDP of Texas was seventh in the world among all states and all countries. Gross product. That's how wealthy we are in Texas. Seemed like a lot of good sense, common sense people voting, but it's changing. It's changing. It can get us here too. Amen. But I want us to pray right now not only for ourselves and where we're at spiritually, but for our country and our state, our government, 
where it's headed right now. Can we do that? God, you see every need that's represented in this place.